happy to be here because three years ago at Ruby Day I did my first ever conference talk about learning to program using Ruby. I had done some other talks in the meantime and the TEDx talk but no technical talk. So I'm very happy to be back three years later with my first technical talk. Oh, thank you. Also have mercy. So I want to talk to you about the Hasura GraphQL engine and how to build modern and serverless backends with it. So first, to introduce myself quickly, um, by day I am a community organizer uh, in Zurich. I'm running a few meetups. Also, we are always looking for speakers, so if you're in the area, you're most welcome. And I'm working as a freelance developer advocate for Hasura, which allows me to do even more community activities. By night, I'm a software developer, so I'm a freelancer and have different customers and projects that I'm working on. And on weekends, now don't laugh, but I'm a motocross mechanic. <laughs> so. so my boyfriend seen in the middle is a professional motocross rider and I'm his mechanic. And it's actually a very nice balance to the other things that I'm doing because I can show a little bit more my badass side. So many people don't know I have it, but I do. So, and it's very nice to get in the dirt and doing some manual work on the bike. And as a bedtime lecture, I'm currently reading the 450 pages manual of our new bike. So, but enough about me. Let's talk about today's agenda. So first, I want to introduce you to a new architecture called three-factor app that's used to build um, serverless applications. Then I want to talk about GraphQL. Who of you is already working with GraphQL? Okay, so for the others will be an introduction. Um, then I want to talk about how to use GraphQL with Hasura and to compare REST, which is the more traditional architectures, to newer architectures with GraphQL. Then we will build a Harry Potter API. Why Harry Potter? You will see later. And this will be a very short excursion to see how you can connect your Hasura backend to a Vue.js frontend. And finally, we also want to write some Ruby code, so we will write a serverless function in Ruby. <laughs> and finally, quickly, I want to talk about the GraphQL and Hasura community. So let's get started with the three-factor app architecture. So it's an architecture pattern for modern, modern full-stack apps proposed by Hasura. It should have high feature velocity and scalability. We will see what this means in just a moment. So this is the more like traditional um, architecture, which is an application that is talking to an API layer, which is getting data from the database and at the same time talking to several microservices. Now, what do the three factors of three-factor app mean? The first one is real-time GraphQL. So it's meant to be simple and flexible for front-end developer workflow. This means that actually um, front-end developers don't have to ask for endpoints from the backend, but can access it themselves very easily through one single endpoint. Then we want to have low latency, which means when we access a resource, we want to get it instantly. And we want to avoid polling with subscriptions. So we don't poll the database every minute or every second, but if something happens, an event gets sent to the client and it will be updated in real time. The second factor is reliable eventing. <coughs> so there is no in-memory state manipulation like in the traditional full-stack frameworks. If a mutation, which means a change in the database happens, an atomic event is created and sent to the client, and it should be reliable. So every event that occurs should be delivered at least once. The third factor is async serverless. So if the database structure for you is not enough and you need business logic, you will write it as event handlers, as serverless functions. You can deploy it in any serverless um, cloud, like Google Cloud or AWS. 
And also very important, the sequence of the event doesn't matter. So it will work without being dependent on a certain sequence. So here again is the older architecture compared to the three-factor architecture. Now we have the app talking to the real-time GraphQL API, which manages the state through the event system that in turn calls, um, like for example, payment microservices in the cloud. We will make an example about this at the end of the talk. So now, what about GraphQL? Uh, maybe you've heard that a lot of um, small and also large companies start switching to GraphQL, and we will have a look at what it what it's about. So GraphQL is a typed query language. So I'm a big fan of types because I don't want to make mistakes. So it helps me avoid errors. You have only one single endpoint. So for every resource that you have in your database, it's the same endpoint. This is the most important thing. So you ask for what you need, and you get exactly this, not more and not less. If you only need the name of a person and not also the email address and so on, you only get the name. You can also get from several um, resources um, fields and in the same request. So you can have, for example, a person and its profile in the same query delivered to you by GraphQL. The backend and frontend separation is made very easily because actually this is the whole backend with one endpoint. So the frontend people have a very easy job accessing data in the database. GraphQL is getting used by more tech companies, also large ones like Shopify, GitHub, and Twitter are switching gradually to GraphQL. Now, this is an example from the GraphQL website. So this is how you describe your data. You have a type object in this case, which will have a name, tagline, and contributors. This is a query, and you ask for a project with the name GraphQL, but you only want the tagline, not also these other things like name and contributors. And the predictable result is exactly uh, what you asked for, not the whole object, and then you have to filter out the tagline. So now, how to use GraphQL? You could build up your own GraphQL server, but you don't have to. So Hasura is a GraphQL engine that allows you to have a GraphQL backend and make requests and create tables and so on. So it's a real-time GraphQL API, and it's open source, which is very important. So if you want to clone it and add your new features by yourself, you can totally do it or check out how they implemented their stuff. And this is the little bit more complicated explanation. So it's an HTTP API to query Postgres using GraphQL. So what happens in the background is that it's actually a Postgres database, but you write GraphQL and act to access the data. So we will see about the query lifecycle in a later slide. It's made to run in a Docker container, so you can also deploy it to Heroku, but for all other cases, it runs, for example, in Google Cloud or AWS, it runs inside a Docker container. If you have a project with an existing Postgres database, you can use Hasura on top, so you don't have to migrate like in one single step. So you can add your, your project to Hasura and use them at the same time and make the gradual migration so that you can take time to do it. It can be in, deployed to any cloud where Docker is also running, which is basically almost every cloud. You can have all the different authentication types that are, that are frequently used, for example, JW, JWT tokens, AWS lambdas, or access keys. And there is a Hasura console, which is a UI that allows you to add tables, uh, manually add data, and create relationships. So we will see this, how it works in a minute. The engine is written in Haskell, which makes it really fast. So Hasura currently is the fastest GraphQL engine on the web, thanks to it being written in Haskell. And this is an interesting fact. So they started off as an agency. And they had um, web application projects for customers, and they felt the need to implement their own engine for their project. And then they wrote the Hasura GraphQL engine. And then last year, other people and companies started getting interested in, in the engine. And now they made it open source in June of last year. 
So Hasura's goal is to have low latency. So we don't want to wait if we, we query resources, we want to get it instantly. We want to have high throughput. So as I said before, we want to have several resources in the same query. It should be light on resources, so not use a lot of CPU and memory. And I think for most projects, this is fast enough. So if you're starting off and you have a new project, this will be fast enough until a certain point. But if you get very successful, which I hope you will, and you have a lot of terabytes of data and millions of users, then probably these are the wrong tools. Now, I said we will look at what happens if you make a query to, to the Hasura engine. So the first thing that happens is the session resolution. So um, the authorization happens and the headers get, get analyzed. Then the query which comes in as this weird string is parsed and the header and the body get separated. The third is that the query is validated if it's like semantically valid, but also if the user has permission to access or to write on this um, resource. Then, the, this is the interesting part, the query gets translated to SQL because Postgres is using SQL. Then the data is extracted from the Postgres database and finally it is sent back as a GraphQL response to the client. So now, I learned this GraphQL stuff with Star Wars API, but I don't like Star Wars. So to make it a little more fun for me, I implemented my own Harry Potter API. And quickly, because we, want to, we will build the beginning of this API, so I want to see how it looks like. So we have movies and scenes. One movie has many scenes. We have characters and actors, and for simplicity we say an actor always has one character and the other way around. We have species, each, for example, human or house elf, and every character is of a certain species. And then we want to connect movies and characters, which is a many-to-many -many relationship, so we need a joint table, in this case, movie characters. As I said, we will build the beginning of, of this API, but I will make this API open once I added all the data, so you can also use the Harry Potter API to learn and don't have to use the Star Wars API. <laughs> okay, so we want to compare the more traditional REST architecture to the GraphQL architecture with serverless. So REST has one endpoint for every resource. So in our case, we have an endpoint for movies, for characters, for actors, for everything. And there is a lot of chaining. If we want to have the actor of the character of the movie, then you, yeah, it can get very complicated. And I actually, in January, I implemented an API in Rails, and the requirements were not very clear in the beginning, so they told me, we only need create and, and delete for this resource, and then the requirements changed. So there was a lot of work just adapting all the endpoints. And yeah, so it can get very messy. And with REST, you use all the um, HTTP methods, like get, post, delete, and update. And the poten potential of overfetching and underfetching is very high. So, so the potential to take too many resources and then only use very little from it or actually not getting what you ask for is, is big. Compared to GraphQL, where you have one single endpoint, there is get and post request, but with Hasura it's always the same endpoint and always a post request. And as we've seen before, you only get the data that you really need. So now, if we want to have a website that lists all the Harry Potter movies, then this is the, the endpoint in REST, like slash movies, which is um, the index in Rails. So if we want to have the characters of one single movie, it's slash characters, slash ID, and ca characters. And if we want to have the actors, you see where this is going. So it can be very complicated. Now let's see how to create a project with Hasura. Now I hope, oh yes. Okay. So this is um, the website. You can see all the different cloud providers um, where you can deploy um, your project. We will start with Heroku because it's, it's very simple and it's free. Actually, you don't pay for Hasura. You only pay if you, um, for the cloud provider, but Hasura is completely free. 
So we say deploy on Heroku. And here, those of you who know Heroku, you know you have to mention a name that is completely unique. Nobody else um, can have used it before. And then we can deploy the app. And then you already have your project. And this will take a while. And in the meantime, we will look at the template that is actually deployed. So this is the Hasura engine. And in the app JSON, where all the configuration happens, we see here at the bottom that there is a Postgres add-on that is deployed, which means that we will, like the database will be a Postgres database. And the hobby dev means the free tier of Heroku. So now the project is ready, so we can view it. And now we can see the Hasura console. On the top, you see, um, oh, actually, you cannot see it as well as me. But this is the, the endpoint um, that you use from front end or anywhere, just a single endpoint. The request headers, by default, it's already um, content type. And here, you can add your queries to test it. Is there a way to make this like, view a little better? Because I can see it fine here. I will continue. Um, maybe it will get better. So to create um, a table, you can just go to data, create table. I will read it so that you can see it better. So table name is movies. As the column, we have to define an ID for every table. So we can use auto increment ID, but we will use UUID. And Hasura provides um, helper methods to create um, this UUID automatically when we create an object. And we will keep this very simple. So our movies just have a title with type text and a release date with tape uh, tape type date. And you can see here you have to name the types, which is why you know it's a typed query language. And here we have to define, define a primary key, which is, in our case, the ID. And then we can add the table. So very simple. Now let's fill in some data. Normally, you will probably not do this with your uh, maybe to try it out, but um, you will have your front end that will provide the server with, with the data. But just to test how everything works, we can add here a new movie, of course, with the correct release date. Yes, so very simple. And if we go to browse rows, this is all the data that, are, that is already in the database, so we can check with the automatically created UUID as well. Now we want to make queries to our database. So we have a table and we have some data. So queries are used to fetch data from the server. <coughs> and, oh, oh. You can see it here. <laughs> so it says here, query. It's very simple. It says query, and then movies and title. I think this is now a problem. Should we try my laptop again? But I have to authorize like 15 videos. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's. Yes, you don't have to put it in. It's don't perfect. Touch. Yes. Ah, and okay. Um, settings. Yeah. Where is it? Finding the code, right? Where is it? It's there. This place.
Okay, so now it works. So in the Azure console, we can write a query, and it's as simple as writing query, then which resource you want to query, and what fields you want to have. We want to have title and release date, but you can also have just the title. And then it will show up on the other side. Here you could also, Azure offers all the database um, features like only listing the first five movies or only listing the movies with a certain name and so on. So I've already introduced how the API looks like and I want to tell you a little bit more about GraphQL relationships and how they work. So there is the one-to-one -one relationship which is called an object relationship. In our case, this is um, character and actor, as we've seen before. <coughs> the one-to-many relationship is because one resource has an array of another resources. In our case, movie, a movie has many scenes. And finally, the many-to-many -many relationship, which consists of both object relationship and error relationship. And we have to create a join table. We've also seen this. So here we will make one example. We have to go to data and our characters table because we will now link actors and characters. So we can modify and then we have to add the actor ID inside the character table. And we say it's a UUID and we add the column. Then we can edit the actor ID and we say here that it's a foreign key and we have to reference the table that re it refers to and we save. So to see this in action, we now have an, an actor ID on the characters table, and we can add the relationship. It's already suggested by Hasura, and we can just add it, and we call it actor, which is fine, and we save it. So now we actually want to connect one actor to one character. So we go to the actors table, copy the link, copy the UUID of a single actor. And now you can see in the characters table we have new the actor ID that we could, we can add and we add the actor ID and save. Okay, and now one character is, act is um, connected to one actor so we can make a new query characters and we will still um, want the name of the character and then we can use actor just as if it would be a field um, of the characters table and we also want the name of the actor. If we run the query we can see this is null because we didn't um, connect it but the two that we connected you can see here in the query result. I think this is enough. All this, the error relationship works very similarly and it's always suggested by Hasura, um, the relationship that you can add. So most of the times you can just say add and everything works. So now we learned how to read from the database we, um, by making queries, but we also want to write to the database with mu mutations. So we want to modify data. We want to add, update and delete our resources and for this, we will write a very simple query to add movies. So we say mutation, add movie. Then we have to, um, to state the parameters, which is the title. And we have to state the type because it's um, typed query language. And if we put an exclamation <laughs> mark, it means that the field is required. So you have, to, you have to pass it. And the same with the release date. Then um, we have the helper method insert movies um, that is provided by Hasura and we pass an array of objects. Why? Because we could add several um, movies in one single mutation. So we say title equals the title that we pass and the same for the release date. And for every mutation that you make, you have to state what it returns. So. Just in a second, we have here the method returning. And for our case, we will just return the ID of the newly created movie. 
or you could also return the title or whatever you want. And before we make the query, we have to um, state the query variables that we pass when we insert a new movie. And when we hit play, then you can see that the new movie is created. And now if we go to browse rows, you can see here on the bottom the, the movie is actually inserted. So you don't, if you have like a modern applications, you want to have um, real-time updates. So you don't want to have to reload when a new resource is added. So for this, we have subscriptions. A subscription is um, when you have a query that basically sends an update to the client if something new happens. And again, no polling. We don't have to poll database, but we the update is sent to the client. So to we see we have three movies here in the database. And to write the subscription, it's very simple. It's actually exactly the same as query, but with the name subscription. So we say movies title and release date, and then we start it. And now you can see a stop button. So this means from this point, the subscription is running. So we see we have three movies. And now we manually insert a new movie. And then it should get updated on the console where we made the subscription without having to reload because it's, it's listening for events. So we save. And we see the fourth movie is inserted and we didn't have to reload. So I think this is pretty great, especially if you have then later um, JavaScript front end and you get new data and you don't have to reload. So obviously, like with all the database services, you have permissions. For every resource, you have a tab permission. And the default is that you are an admin and you can do all, um, the, all the functions with, as an admin, like insert, delete, and everything. But you could also add um, a role user that can only read from the database. Now, maybe you have seen on the top right corner that it always said secure endpoints, or maybe you did, you couldn't read because it's very bad resolution. But it suggests you to secure your endpoint here at the top. And this means that it requires an, like an access token so that not everybody can just write or read from your database. So we go to our Heroku console where we have listed all our projects. We choose our projects. And under settings, you find the config variables. And here you can add the Hasura um, GraphQL access key. And we just name it in this case secret. You will obviously have a much better like um, a secret that is not so easy to guess. And now when we go back to the console, it will not let us in without having to, to tell it the, the access key. So we have to say secret. And now you can see in the headers, the admin secret is added with the password. So everything we do from the console from this point will, will send this access key in the header. Obviously, if you then have, uh, for example, a view or a React uh, front end, you will have also to send it in the headers to access the data. No. I'm very sorry about this. <laughs> Thank you.
Yes. So it just stopped? Uh, yes. Suddenly? Oh. Before it worked. Oh. Yeah. Can you change the. Um, no. Solution? No, I don't want to. Ah, okay. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Okay, so this is just a very short excursion. I just want to see you how to uh, you to see how to connect your GraphQL backend to a Vue.js frontend. It's very similar with React and Angular. This is just one example. So, in the main JS, which is where like it's the entry point for a Vue application, you will have to do several imports. For example, the Apollo client. The Apollo client is used um, for any JavaScript framework to access uh, GraphQL um, servers. You need to import HTTP link because we have one access point that we um, want to target. And we have to import Vue Apollo to use Apollo and Vue together. This is how we, we basically instantiate the HTTP link passing the endpoint we've seen before in the console. We pass the link um, when we make a new Apollo client. And we pass Apollo client as the default client. So this is like the configuration you need for, for your app, and, and that's it. So now I don't know how much you know about components and JavaScript framework, but we will look at two components. One of them is the movie item, and the other one is the movies list. So the movies list consists of several movie items. And here we have a template in the movie item file where we say what we want to list for each movie. So the title, director, composer, and release date. And we have to say how to export it. So we say the name is movie item, which will allow us to use this component in the, in the list component as a movie item. So now in the movies list, we can see the movie item um, a component used here. And um, as you see, it's not uh, H, um, HTML, um, typical HTML, but it's, um, this is how components work in modern JavaScript frameworks. And we basically iterate through all the movies and show what we've seen before in the movie item template. In the movies list, we also have to import the movie item because this is what we will use as um, components and the um, GraphQL because we want to make a query now. So this is actually the most important, um, the most important part of um, what I want to tell you about connecting your Azure backend to the front end because you have a query here and this is exactly the same how you would use it in the console. So you can just try it out in the console how it works and then copy it to your front end and it will, be, it will work. And again, we have to export it. So we say it's a movies list. It um, consists of movie item component. We will return the array of movie items of movies. And we have to call the Apollo client because, as we've seen before, it will help us to make GraphQL queries to our GraphQL backend. And we say the query is get movies that we defined um, in the slide before. So this is how it would look like. There is also a form that we haven't looked at um, before. And here we can see the list um, of all the movies. There are several more now. So you can see this is the first one. And we have all um, eight movies here. And I just want to show you the um, serverless like instant updates. So we will now add a, a new movie. And we hope it will get added um, in real time uh, to, to our list without us having to relo reload the browser. So we have a new movie. With the correct data, of course, and yes. and we send it, and then you will see it um, instantly appear like on the top of the list, depending on where, how you sort um, your movies. And if we go now to our API, 
There we have to reload because we didn't uh, uh, make a subscription, so we have to reload. But we will see the new movie on the top. Yes. So now, this was all about GraphQL and Hasura, but we also want to write at least a little bit of Ruby code be because we all love Ruby. Um, so we will do this with serverless functions. So what are serverless functions? They are running in the cloud. You can deploy them to several different cloud providers. We will see this just in a minute. In Hasura, you will use them together with event triggers. So you say in the Hasura console, if this and this happens, for example, for example, you want to subscribe to new movies. So you um, have a trigger on insert movies, and then it will send an email to all the people who are interested that a new movie was inserted to the database. It's cost effective because at the beginning it's free with most cloud providers, and then when you get very successful and have a lot of traffic, then you pay based on your on your use. You don't have to buy like a bucket or whatever uh, it, front up, but you only pay for what you use. There is no infrastructure management, so it will be handled by the cloud providers. Your cl your code will be hosted in their cloud, which can also be a disadvantage for some people because not everybody trusts third parties and prefers to maintain the code themselves. Um, async business logic, we've talked about this before. And this is how um, it, uh, serverless functions work with Hasura. So you have APIs and GraphQL mutations, as we've seen before. Then they will trigger the Postgres database. And depending on if you have an event trigger, it will it will invoke events as serverless functions in the cloud. So where can you deploy it? The easiest is Glitch. It's free, but you can only write JavaScript. So there is Google Cloud. They have several more languages, like also Python, I think, and Java. Azure has two to three languages. And AWS added Ruby support last October. So this is the only cloud provider at the moment where we can write serverless functions in Ruby. This is the last video. I hope this will not crash. So we have here the AWS console. And we need, of obviously, we need to have an account. And we can choose our region where we want to host the data. So we go on Lambda. And here we create a new function. We already have one, Hello Ruby, but now we want to add a new one. And we author it from scratch. So we name it, name it Movie Inserted, because we want to do something when a new movie is inserted. We can add Ruby 2.5 and create the function. So this takes a little while, because it has to load all the Ruby environment when we deploy the function. So now this is our function. It has a name, but it doesn't have any code. So we will add very simple code. So as I said, you can send emails. You can invoke um, actions in another app. What we will do, we will just take the information of the inserted movie and, and give back the title and um, the release date to the server. So first, we have to parse um, parse the event body, because we need to take out um, the data that we need. And now we will um, define a response. And the response will be sent back to the server as, as a JSON. So we have the title. And we get the title from the object that is sent uh, to the function, so uh, movie title and the release date is um, the movie release date. And we send back a status called um, 200. Obviously, here you can also do error handling and send back something else in case it doesn't work, but we will keep it very simple here. And as a JSON, we just send back the response. Then we save the function. And now we have the function, but we don't have anything to trigger it. So we need to add an API gateway. And we make a new API. 
For now, we make it open. Obviously, you will have much better authentication with access key or something. And here we can see uh, the trigger that we created. We have everything, so we can save. OK, and this now it provides us with an API endpoint that we can copy. And this is now the event um, tr trigger that we can invoke um, from Hasura. So we go to events. And here, uh, this is the introduction to the event. So you can, you have several uh, tutorials on how to deploy with each um, cloud provider. So we add a trigger name, move inserted, the same as before. And we have to say which table it is and that we only want to invoke it if there is an insert. And here we can just copy the API key and yes. So now we want to add a new movie and see if the event actually gets triggered. So we insert a new movie with the correct date. And then um, we have an events console where we can see if this worked out. So we save the movie. And now in events, you can see there is the name of our event, and it's the first one, like the last one that we used. And here we can see the request that was sent from the from Hazura to the client, which is why how we know that to how to to extract the actual information in the cloud function. And the response that gets sent back to the server is what we defined before as the JSON here on the bottom. So it works. This is, is like just a hello world example, but you can use it for like real life um, examples like emails. So now the technical part is over. Thank God it didn't break again. So I quickly want to talk to you about the community. So Hasura has great documentation for myself. When I learned it, I found everything um, in their documentation. There is a Discord channel, so for every question you have, you can just ask um, the community. They will answer like at most five minutes it will take because there are so many people using um, Hasura or even just in general GraphQL, you can ask any questions. A as I said, it's open source, so you can access the GitHub repository and also regular um, features like events uh, um, that happen or new features will be published also on GitHub. My conclusion is um, for GraphQL, you can use it for quick and easy database access. So as you've seen, it, it's very quick. Hasura is easy um, to set up. So as you've seen, we just um, created some tables, so it's very easy compared to writing endpoints with REST and having endpoints for every resource. It's easy to connect to your front end of course, this was just a short excursion, but I wrote a blog post on how to connect your Hasura backend with the Vue.js frontend, so ask me later if you are interested. For If you want more business logic than is possible with the engine itself, you can use serverless functions. And this is for me the most important, it's low maintenance. So because it's managed by a third party, you don't have to take care of updating the server. So this will, take, will be taken care of. The community is great. They are happy to answer all your questions. And Harry Potter for the win. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so keep in touch. Um, on Twitter, I'm Ruby Dwarf. I don't think I have to explain the name. So yes, and I'm around if you have any questions. Thank you very much.